Um, welcome. We're so happy everybody's here. Um, we're delighted to be with you guys. This is the fifth week in a row, so this is kind of fun. Um, and we know that we've got some new people in the mix. So uh, we just wanted to go over how we've set this up. If you guys have any questions, um, we, this is a webinar, so uh, you can see us, but we can't see or hear you. So if you have any questions, we've got a chat box at the bottom. Um, I'm sure many of you are quite familiar with Zoom now, but um, go ahead and chat in the box. You can change it to um, send your message to all attendees if you want everyone to see uh, your message. And that's been actually really fun over the weeks to see where everybody's um, joining us from, what they're eating and drinking. So that's, that's fun. Um, there's a Q and A box as well. Feel free to drop questions in there. The great uh, Angela Douglas is over here with us. She's monitoring the chat and the Q and A and she'll share the questions with us. So um, we- I feel like you should stick your hand in the screen yeah, can, and wave yeah, yeah, oh, there, there, there we go, yeah. she's right there. <laughs> so, um, so send us your questions. We've definitely left um, time in here for that. Um, so we definitely want to uh, hear from folks. Uh, today we are excited to jump in as it sort of feels fitting on May 1st to some what we're calling springtime wines, the uh, 2018 Albarino and the 2018 Unoaked Chardonnay. Um, the reason we paired these today is, uh, you know, stylistically they, they feel sort of similar. They're light bodied, really fruit forward. Um, they're nice with a little bit of chill in them. So as it starts to get warm across the country, uh, it's a fun one. One of these is a fun one to sort of um, open up and, and taste through. So that's why we paired them. Uh, but there are some differences that we're excited to go through in terms of the history and their origins and um, how we approach them. So we will uh, talk a little bit about each of these wines uh, and then we will definitely taste them. But you should not wait for us. Please, uh, please, I hope you have a glass of something full uh, in front of you. <coughs> Cheers. Um, we think it would be fun. As I said, we are going to talk about um, our notes on these wines towards the end of the, the session. So um, in the meantime, if you wanna drop into the chat box your thoughts about the wines, different tasting notes, aromas, things like that, um, we'll share some of those and it'll be kind of fun to see where we agree and where we disagree. So um, without further ado, Mike Hendry. Right, and, and part of the point, I, I think with all this, we, we're really tasting two wines. We had sort of opening up something strange and weird if time permits, um, has become kind of a tradition and we'll do that too. But if, if you were here tasting with us, we would normally cover these wines in about 10 minutes and, and we're, we have an hour to share with you. So the idea is that we're trying to, we're, we're trying to talk about the wines. We're, we're maybe trying to sort of teach you about the objectives from a winemaking point of view um, <clears throat> and some of the history and, and perspective. And I, I think with a lot of these wines, perspective is important and, and when it comes to wine you know history isn't everything but I think if you're <clears throat> ignoring the history you're, you're partly missing the point. Um, I also wanted to add one more thing Megan mentioned spring and I, I thought it might be interesting to kind of catch you up a little bit on the vineyard and, and what we're doing yeah. now. Um, <clears throat> I feel like yeah every, every year th there's one very specific week where we go from more or less being on top of everything to being hopelessly behind. Um, and that was that last week, okay. right? So it was, it was the first week we've had fairly cool weather. Um, <clears throat> and then we had some mid eighties kind of days. And, and when it happens warm. like that, the, the vine shoots grow very quickly. And, and we go from really not having much to work on to having more to work on than we can, can keep up with. Um, but it's uh, now we're sort of back in the mid 70s. There's supposed to be some some warmer temperatures next week. But this is the time of the year when we're we're working on our uh, canopy management and, and the shoot thinning, and it's a slow slow process. The canopy would be like all of the the, the vegetative growth, right? Seen, shoots, right? Shoots, the leaves. shoots, leaves, all yeah. of that. Um, and Chardonnay, as we've touched on in other um, other tastings, is usually one where we see bud break first, um, right. goes through bloom first. Yes. T yeah. Traditionally, okay. So that's kind of going to be our bellwether for when things yeah. start moving in the vineyard. Bloom, bloom is actually for, for the different grape varieties. It's bunched together a little more closely than, mm. than bud break is. But Chardonnay is is pretty much always the first in, in all those. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I, I was going to talk a little about Chardonnay and sort of our history with Chardonnay, and I've I've touched on some of this before, but. Um, it's important to realize, so th this is our unknown Chardonnay, and you know, in, in the Henry label, we have uh, 
two, typically, we have our barrel fermented and our unoaked, uh, and that those are the only two wines in, in our lineup that are most importantly distinguished by winemaking. So we have these two uh, wines here today because they're really made the same way and the winemaking objective is the same. And what we're trying to do, there are times when you, you know, you, you ferment the wine and you, you've got this wine at the end of the fermentation and sometimes you want to take that wine and, and modify it through an aging process and, and bottle that. The point with these is to really sort of preserve what you've got in the fermenter and, and get it to, to bottle fairly quickly. There are some very sort of interesting um, and really kind of delicious fruit aromatics that take place during fermentation that leave pretty quickly, but there are more, more, more of the, the fruit, um, the, the fresh fruit, the primary fruit characteristics we would call them. Um, sort of fade with time. And that's why we bottle these wines fairly quickly. They're, they're both um, non-malolactic to, to the extent that we can do that. We, we keep that green apple acid in there. Um, and shortly after, you know, everyone gets back from Christmas, we sort of stabilize the, the wines and, and bottle them yeah. um, is the point. But Chardonnay, um, we, we started with unoaked Chardonnay in 2004 and, and we started growing Chardonnay much earlier than that. I Napa again, uh, but between I, you know, when people talk about Napa now, they, they mostly talk about Cabernet, but it's, it's hard to understate, overstate, it's hard to overstate how, how yeah. important Chardonnay was to Napa, um, for a period of time in the, in the seventies and eighties and between 1975 and 1985, which is, is Napa sort of on its way to being, modern Napa really, um, a, a very important decade. Plantings of new plantings of Chardonnay were about 4,300 acres. Um, and for Cabernet, they were just a little over 600. So, um, and also sort of in that time frame in, in 1980, in the middle of that decade, uh, Chardonnay was worth on average $1,100 a ton and Cabernet was worth 600. So, you know. Chardonnay reigns supreme. Right, really, and, yeah. and at best, you know, Cabernet was a distant runner up along with, with everything else. Um, but as Chardonnay became more and more prominent and people were, were more excited about it, I think the style of wine that everyone really expected or certainly the style of wine that they took the most seriously was a, a barrel fermented style. And, and to a degree, this sort of turned into, for, for some winemakers and, and some wine styles that were very successful, sort of the, the more oak, the better. And, and oak became a bigger and, and bigger thing. And, and also very predictably, um, there began to be a, a, some sort of a backlash to this. So there were people who started looking for less oak and, and who wanted un-oak styles of wine. Um, but it was a challenge from, a, and in two degrees still is, is a challenge from a winemaking perspective because people take, even if you spend all the same time and energy, energy and effort in the vineyard making the best fruit that you can, people seem to take these un styles of wine sort of less seriously. And by that, I mean, e even if they're fantastic wines, it's, it's very difficult to sell them for the same price that, it, that it, you would with a, a barrel fermented style. So. We started, um, our, our first Chardonnay was what we called Block 9, and, and these were vines that had originally been planted as Zinfandel in 1974, um, and then 20 acres of that was grafted over to, to Chardonnay in the early 80s, um, and there were really two different clones in there, um, and the first Chardonnay bottlings in the Henry label were, were from that vineyard, um, and there was really no specification of, of winemaking. We didn't break that out, and then we sort of moved into, we as we developed the property to the south, which I, I've mentioned in the past, we planted two new Chardonnay blocks. Um, we actually planted three, only two of which we still have, but blocks 19 and 20 were a couple of Dijon clones, 95 and 96. So in, I think one of our worst marketing ideas ever, but in a very uh, really interesting winemaking perspective, we, we bottled a clonal difference in Chardonnay. So we, we bottled, one that was a blend of blocks 19 and 20, uh, and one that was from our block nine and 21. So nine and 21 and 19 and 20, and even though tasting them side by side was really pretty fascinating, um, they were names that nobody could keep straight. So it, it was sort of very confusing. And eventually 
as, as we got more and more interested in, in wanting to produce an unout Chardonnay style, um, rather than have three, we, we moved to having an unoaked and barrel fermented. Um, so those are the two. And I, I think unoaked now, it, again, um, I said this a, a few episodes ago, but unoaked is a name that people recognize more. Barrel fermented is, is often assumed, but less often spelled out. Yeah. Um, and some of the confusion about, I, I have a quote that I want to show you. Oh, One yeah. of our first, actually, I think the very first review of our unoaked Chardonnay sort of shows you what happened here. Um, are we ready on that? Or? We are ready. Here we go. So this is, yes, the first review of the unoaked Chardonnay. Here you go. It's, and, and I will, I know everyone watching can read, but here we go. Henry's Vineyard, located west of Napa City, is in a cool location and vital acidity marks this wine. It has green apple and cinnamon spice flavors, while oak adds the usual smoke and vanilla complexities. So. <laughs> and it you says unoaked straight on the label. Yes. So. And it, so <laughs> I mean, I, th I think, I don't know what happened there. Maybe they tasted a different wine. I, I don't know, but I, I think it illustrates some of the assumption that people had that if it was Chardonnay, it, it must come from a barrel. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's something we see a lot in the tasting room. People come in with very strong opinions about Chardonnay, um, particularly, particularly California Chardonnay. And it's they've even sort of coined a term, you know, you know ABC, so people who drink anything but Chardonnay. Um, and I think it's, again, as, as with all wine, it's a really personal thing, right? So some people really love those sort of, you know, the characteristics that barrels impart, you know, that sort of cinnamon, the vanilla, the smoke, um, all of that is from a barrel. And if you love that, um, you were in luck for many years because that's how the majority, I think, of, of California Chardonnay producers were making um, their Chardonnay. But if you didn't, uh, you know, you kind of wrote off the whole grape. And I will put myself, I will, this is, I know, a safe space full of uh, Hendry fans. I will put myself in that camp. When I got into wine, I, I really love stuff like I'll bring you know, these lighter things. I was like, oh, I don't like Chardonnay. That's not for me. Um, and now it's, it's honestly one of my favorite grapes. And I think it is really helpful to think about the style in which it's made and sort of, you know, disentangle that a little bit from um, the grape itself. So it's kind of cool to, you know, now that you've seen a lot of people um, across the state and definitely here in Napa start to make Chardonnay in lots of different styles, playing around with how much oak, you know, if any, um, people are, are, some people are still putting it through malolactic fermentation, some are not. Um, you get, I think, a lot of different uh, Chardonnays out on the market, which, um, to me makes it the most interesting wine to taste when you go tasting here in Napa, because you could go to 10 wineries and have 10 pretty different Chardonnays. And I don't think you see that with, you know, 10 different Cabernets or Zinfandels or something. So um, I think it's kind of an exciting wine right now. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, it, it's a, it's a grape with a long, very long track very record. Long. And, and we were saying too, yeah. that um, even within, so certainly within Napa, you know, in the last couple of decades, Cabernet has, has gotten a lot more atten attention, but within California, um, up until 2018, just two years ago, Chardonnay was the most widely planted grape, period. So yeah. Chardonnay is still, you know, it's it's a, a real heavyweight yeah. in the, the wine category. And there are almost 100,000 acres of, of Chardonnay in California, 93. 92,000 or so, yeah. Uh, and, and maybe almost a quarter of that in Burgundy alone. So, um, yeah, California, we were looking at sort of, I mean, Chardonnay is one of the top five most widely planted grapes in the world. Um, there are just over half a million acres of it. And so California accounts for just under a fifth of that. Um, so we're definitely, you know, California, I think is, you know, just as sort of important in the global Chardonnay world as other areas. We, we grow a lot of it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but what, one of the other things that's happened here too, as, and I've, I've, touched on this before as well, but as farming costs have gone up and, and Chardonnay values have remained relatively static, it's been harder and harder to grow um, Chardonnay at reasonable crop levels and, and sort of have it pay for itself. So whenever, I, whenever I'm looking for a quote to illustrate a point, you know, Jancis Robinson's a, you know, the, the wine expert that I, that I use often, but yeah. if you look at her, um, you know, many of us have that Oxford companion to wine. And yeah, if, if you go uh, look at the first section on Chardonnay and Janice Robinson, she essentially says, you you know, if you're, if you're doing it at more than four and a half tons per acre, it's not going to taste very good. And to do it really well, you need to do it at less than two tons per acre. 
Um, and here the problem is average farming costs are sort of north of $10,000 and average Chardonnay values are only around 3,000 a ton. So obviously you're not, you know, you're not doing it at, at two tons per acre. I've also talked about here and, and especially with a wine like this. So these, uh, these two Chardonnay blocks, so they, if you look at the back, we, we list a number of blocks, but in this case, this is just these Dijon clones. They, they tend to be a leaner, a little bit lighter. I, I think of sort of more citrus that, that um, there, there's a little more tropical fruit, a little, a little more richness in some of the, the Wente selections, um, but it, it's a leaner type of Chardonnay. Um, I, I just completely lost my point. Where was I going? <laughs> um, I'm not sure. So this, this anyway, is, is from blocks. Oh, they, they average about three tons per acre. That's where I was going. The, the other blocks are, are actually under two. Um, but there's very little good vineyard that's devoted to Chardonnay and Napa anymore. Uh, and the places where it does grow, it's down to about 12%, I think. But, but where it does grow, it tends to be done at relatively high crop levels. Much of that is for sparkling. Um, and you don't, I mean, it's very difficult to, to do a low crop level style of Chardonnay and put it in an unoaked bottle as well. Um, for, for some of the other reasons I talked about and then sort of the prices you sell it for. So this is a wine, I mean, we, we take it very seriously. We're not, you know, it's, it's not our most expensive wine, but that's, it, it also costs less to make than the barrel fermented style. But it's certainly not a statement that we like it less. It, it's a different style of, of Chardonnay. Right. Yeah. And, and it, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, well, and, and, you know, taking out the cost of the barrels, you know, that helps. Um, but I think, you know, again, aside from just even the financial piece, it is something that we just enjoy, right? Yeah. Sort of showing off those flavors. And, um, you know, as Mike said, we, we make these two wines very similarly. You know, they're in stainless steel the whole time. Um, so they don't see any, any oak barrels. They ferment a little bit colder, which helps preserve, right? Some of right. those really nice fruit aromas. Um, the red wines, we tend to ferment at a slightly warmer temperature. So, you know, every step of the process, we've kind of got the fruit, I would say, right? right. Sort of yeah. foremost in our mind is, you know, wanting to preserve that, um, keep that kind of nice acidic backbone here, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, the Albu should we do the yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. move on. Well, we're going to talk a little about Albarino yeah. now, and then, and then well, maybe while she's talking about Albarino, I'll have some Chardonnay. <laughs> oh, I, I yeah. should have been drinking the whole time you were talking. I didn't realize. Um, so the Albarino, um, you know, again, we've paired paired them in terms of their sort of stylistic similarities. You know, a lot of really nice light fruit, tropical fruit here. I think. Um, Wonderful. I love, I, I'm an acid junkie. I love that sort of acidity, that kind of mouth-watering um, sensation you get on this. But in terms of its origins and its history, it, it couldn't sort of be more different from Chardonnay. Um, as we said, there are, you know, just over, you know, a little over half a million acres of Chardonnay worldwide. Um, Albarino, it, we struggled to sort of get some precise figures, but, you know, probably well under 100,000 or so. You know, you see about 30,000 uh, in Spain, which is, um, Spain or Northern Portugal is the homeland of Albarino. There's a bit of debate about, you know, where precisely, but the Iberian Peninsula um, and, and Albarino is really associated with the Rias Baixas, which is this part of Galicia, sort of the very Northwest corner of Spain, right on the Atlantic coast. Um, I think many of them don't think of themselves as Spanish, but yes. Yes, yes yeah, it's a real different kind of history um, there. And um, so, you know, but that's, um, the grape that sort of Rio Spicious has made its name, um, you know, working with. If you go to, go down to Portugal, it's a huge component of Vino Verde. So if you love that kind of light, often kind of slightly fizzy um, Portuguese wine, there's often a lot of Albarino in there. Um, and I think it was probably about 10 years ago that, you know, it really kind of took off, uh, you know, globally. You started seeing more plantings elsewhere. At least that's what we saw in California. So we went back and looked at, um, the, the Great Crush Report and the Acreage Report, which if you've tuned into other episodes, we've talked a little bit um, about, you know, these, these publications that come out that try and sort of summarize in data the state of the uh, wine grape industry in California. And uh, until you see plantings of, a, of 50 acres of a grape statewide, it's kind of grouped into other. Um, so we didn't see it show up on the Crush Report until about 2009. Um, and at the time, there were about 100 acres of it in the state. 
Um, and so we planted our Albarino in 2003, right. right? And we think around then there were about 28 so acres. So in, in 2003, there, there were 28 acres of, of Albarino in California. Yeah. And, and that meant that we had 10%. Of it. <laughs> so we, we, we had two and a half. And, and you sort of sound like a pioneer when you say it that way. But really, there were a bunch of people who um, started doing it at a similar time. Certainly, the first one here to do it was Michael Havens. Uh, and we became interested in it because of our experience with him. Yeah, so um, now there are about 450 acres or so of it in the state, sort of actually spread um, all over. So, you know, the part of Spain, I think this is one thing that um, to me is sort of interesting. You know, we, we have this conception of this part of Spain is very cool. Um, you know, they do get more rain than we do, um, but it's not necessarily a cool climate grape when you think about where, you know, all the different places it's growing. So we've found it to be, you know, really successful here. Um, the, the part of Spain, it comes from the Reyes Baixas, um, they can get up to 65 inches of rain per year. We are far below that, half of that really, right? Um, we average about 30. This year we have around 15, so yeah. we're around half of that. And um, in the summer, we calculated what, about eight inches of rain over right. there per year and here. So, in, and by that we mean June, nothing. July, August, September, right? If you, those four months, we're, we're here, we average about three eighths of an inch of rain in those four months. They, they get around eight. So it is, I mean, I don't think of Spain as, you know, Cool and rainy, rainy, but rainy yeah. that part of it really is. Yeah, it's a very common, I feel like every wine writer that I've read, you know, pieces on this part of Spain, everybody compares it to Ireland. So um, if anyone- I mean, I, I saw mostly eucalyptus trees when I was there, so. <laughs> Not a lot of eucalyptus in Ireland, yes, but green, rainy. Um, so, you know, but here in California, you see a lot of it, you know, in, you know, what we call cool. And again, if you tuned into the climate episode, you know that there are a lot of caveats with that. But cooler regions like San Luis Obispo, a lot of it down in Lodi. So San Joaquin County has a lot of it. Um, so, you know, Napa is now, you know, just a small piece of the pie in terms of, you know, statewide plantings. Um, but we've now got, we've added to the original block that Mike talked about developing in 2003. We've got, what, about six acres? Uh, closer to seven, Six I think. and a half, yeah, yeah. seven acres yeah. um, of Albarino now. So it's been kind of a fun, um, a fun addition to our lineup. Yeah, it's, it's been, and, and our, I mean, really it was George's idea to, to start growing Albarino. And I, I knew very little about it at the time. I, I remember very well going down to the, to the Napa vineyard that had it, which is right in the, I mean, I think Michael, I don't know all the history of that planting, but I, it looks like someone was trying to get to the coolest windiest part of Napa they could and I, I think they succeeded really it's right in the estuary of the Napa River um, and the literally the water tables a couple of feet down you can actually see upwelling salt damage in that vineyard um, and when we and I, I alluded to this earlier also but when we wanted to start growing it here we were immediately told like no you're too hot there um, and it, you know we were too cold for Cabernet but too hot for Albarino and too so and you really don't know until you try to grow it. And one of the things that I've started to think about Albarino is that it's not, I, I went to Rio Spices and I, I looked at it. And one of the things that stuck in my mind was seeing unirrigated cornfields next to Albarino, vineyards, which sort of did not from a distance look like good vineyard land to me. Um, and I started thinking about, you know, that Albarino, what it tastes like, and the Albarino we grow, and, and they both taste like Albarino, um, I started to feel like it's not necessarily that Albarino needs a, a cool climate. It's just that it's a little unusual and that it doesn't really get messed up by one. Um, it tolerates it. Better. Right. It, it tolerates it better. And there, there are many vines that varieties that growing in that area would be a disaster. Um, so I think some of our grapes, like Cabernet Sauvignon, for example, are, are very expressive of soil and site and annual variation, and, and Albarino is less so. Um, and this is interesting because now we, we see the bulk of Albarino in California actually growing in some of the hottest climates. Yeah, that was my favorite piece of research and looking at, at the acreage report is there are four counties in California that account for about three quarters of the plantings. Um, and one of them was San Luis Obispo, which, you know, 
seen a lot of, of all brand new coming out of there, so that wasn't surprising. Um, San Joaquin County, which again, there's a lot in Lodi, and, and so that kind of made sense. And then the other two were Sacramento and Yolo counties, which we think of as quite warm. And, you know, we can't account, we don't know where in the counties those are planted and what their individual conditions are. But um, it, that was interesting to think about, um, you know, because there is this sort of story about Albarino and this part of Spain that's, you know, so different from the rest of Spain and really cool and rainy and everything. So um, it's, you know, perhaps a little more versatile and, and resilient than we think. So yeah, um, and it's been a fun lineup. And I mean, I believe part of the original motivation was just to do something a little different, right? Right. You, know, and, you still and, don't see a lot of it here. At least. Yeah, and, and we had a we had a portion of vineyard that we wanted to plant to a, a white grape. Again, I, I think it, in general, it's a very, it's a good vineyard site. We could do a, a range of things mm -hmm. there, but in what we were planting, we thought it was the best candidate for a white grape. And here. You know, Chardonnay was sort of in its decline of, of price and popularity, and, and really everyone else in Napa was growing Sauvignon Blanc, or at least it felt like that. So um, it, it was a look at something new, and this, it's worked out well for us, but there was a time certainly when Albarino was viewed by everybody as kind of obscure, and, and our experience in terms of selling it now has been that there are parts of the country <clears throat> that are very sort of aware of and, and interested in Albarino and other parts that seem completely unaware of it still. So it, it's, a lot has changed in the 15 years that we've been bottling it, but it's still not a, a very mainstream kind of grape. Uh, but it does bring, a, I think, a, a, a unique personality. Watching it grow alongside of the Chardonnay, really what we see in terms of phenology, yeah. sort of the, the timing of, of growth events, it's on a very similar schedule to Chardonnay, but it definitely remains higher in acid as, as the ripening process yeah. goes on. So you, you see sugar accumulation is, is similar to Chardonnay. Acid degradation is much slower. Um, so typically, and you know, so acidity has not been a problem with this grape for us. What's been more of a problem is becoming, and at least for the first several years, becoming comfortable with bottling of becoming comfortable with bottling wine that has such high acidity um, there's right. more of the progression. Yeah. And I think that, you know, just to sort of back up a little bit um, in terms of grape growing 101, you know, over the course of the summer, typically what we're seeing is that sugars are going up in the grapes and, and acids are starting to decline a little bit. And the idea is if you're in a warmer climate, you're going to see more of that than if you're in a cooler climate. So the idea, you know, when people talk about these cool climate grapes is, you know, this is, you know, part of that is, is, going to preserve that acidity in the fruit. And so I think that's probably the, um, the, the, the concern people expressed in saying, oh, this spot is too hot for it, right? Is that you might lose, the fear would be you would lose some of that really nice acidity. But yeah. as Mike has said, we haven't found that to be the case at all. And in fact, um, we pulled the numbers for this one, right? right. The, the, to the, this is the 2018 and um, this is, you know, pretty, pretty acidic as far so as- it, it, has a, it has a pH of 3.18, which in a dry wine is, I mean, that's pretty, Yeah, and the, it's hard to go further. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, without getting into some like, maybe. You, you make the sour face yeah, and you definitely. do a wine tasting at 10 in the morning. And then, <laughs> and then what's the, oh no, Chardonnay? Three. Uh, this, the 3.44, I think is the, okay. the pH on this one. And that's a, a, a log scale, so it's not, right. the difference between two and three is a factor of 10 in acidity, so it, it's, it's a bigger number difference. Three, four to three, one is a pretty big jump. And again, this is the pH scale. So three, one is more acidic than three, right. four, right? Really, it's the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration, which is- But you all knew that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, should we taste them? Since yeah, we're talking about acidity, yeah, let's, let's do the Albarino. Okay, one. so I'm gonna, I've already drunk some, so I'm gonna top up here. Um, we gotta catch up then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, and again, if you've got notes too, we'd love to hear them. And this, I would say, I'm, I'm partial to this one. This is one that I drink a lot of because of that really nice acidity. So I, I think this wine, it's very lean on the palate. It, it's sort of lean and light. It's not rich and fat. Um, certainly it, it has that high level of acidity and it's very kind of direct and intense in its fruit. I, I think of sort of sour peach, kind of a creamy lime character that pretty much define that wine for me. Yeah. I mean, my mouth is still watering, right? Which is typically how we think about acidity is how much your mouth waters. And 
you know, after taking the sip, still, you know, 30 seconds later, my mouth is watering. So a lot of acid there. Um, I agree with those notes, very sort of citrusy, also something a little tropical. And I find that this one sort of year to year, sometimes you get a little more tropical than others. Sometimes it's a little more citrus, but this one, I, I think that that kind of key lime kind of note is, is right on. So it, it's a very, um, it's a very classic sort of seafood wine. And I, I think you like it with seafood for the same reason you like a little lemon juice on your right. fish, right? It, it's, it has that same appeal. And um, they, they do in Maria Spicious, seafood is a big part of their, um, right. and I, I really embarrassed myself in a restaurant there <laughs> by seeing a wine list and, you know, ordered a bunch of seafood, but then there were all these Albarinos for $20 a bottle. So I ordered like six and kind of tasted through them at the table. And I think I- Six bottles? Yeah, I seemed like the best way to, I mean, seemed less expensive than a couple of tastings in Napa. Yeah, so well, that's that's true, go. yes. Um, yeah, so definitely makes sense. You know, they're right on the coast. It's, you know, fishing is a huge part of their um, economy there. So, you know, this goes really nicely. This is my fish taco wine. So mm. perhaps that'll be on the menu tonight, I don't know. Um, should we do the unoaked? Do you make your own fish tacos? I do. Yeah. yeah. Do a little, over? a little slaw with some mango and cilantro and red onion. Pretty tasty. Highly I consume a lot of fish tacos, <laughs> but I don't make them very often. So that this is the, uh, and, and you notice one thing about these wines is, is the color. They're, they're very light in color. Yeah. Um, and that sort of goes along with the grape and, and the level of oxidation. So as they age in bottles that that color gets darker it eventually gets more golden um but they're both they're you know same vintage same bottled within a few days of each other picked within a few days of each other um still both very very light in color yeah and with the uh with the unalt chardonnay i, I mean I, I do there is more density to the wine, there's yeah. more viscosity, sort of. I, I, I look at the unoaked Chardonnay and barrel fermented Chardonnay, there's another sort of jump in viscosity, but you can tell in terms of the weight of the wine on your palate, there's more there's more weight here. Um, I, I find there's sort of more kind of melon sort of fruit to this. Mm -hmm. There's, to me, there's still some, some kind of lemon citrus. I feel like there's a little, when I, tasted it before this it's, it's striking me less this way at the moment but it I, I, I felt like it had a little kind of waxy component on the on the finish on the palate that's not something I normally say about that but it, it struck me that way today also a little um, I, I kind of like lemon it's zest sort yeah. of a, a lemon a little of this hint of this bitter lemon peel kind of thing. Yeah, I feel like tasting one or two also makes a difference. And this is to traditionally how we taste it in the um, in the tasting room. If you come here for a tasting, we often start with the Albarino. We say, you know, it sort of warms up your palate, kind of gets the taste buds going. And, um, you know, it is the more acidic of the two, as we've said. So by contrast, the unoaked is going to feel more viscous. But as Mike pointed out, if you compared it to a barrel fermented Chardonnay or or a lot of other white wines, it, it would still feel, I think, really light and kind of zippy. And um, but yeah, I definitely my mouth's not watering anymore with that one. So, um, you know, it's a little a little fuller bodied of the two. Um, also, I think nice pairing for seafood dishes, you know, if you were doing, um, yeah. you know, tilapia or something like that, that could be really nice. I mean, this, this wine is going to be chicken. nice with most of the, the same things that wine is yeah. really, um, it, it does have a little more, um, yeah, a little more structure, a little more, I mean, it, this is intense in a, a very, uh, you know, lean sort of a way and this is a little a little richer on the palate yeah as i think i've said three times now but, <laughs> but um, i feel like your preference really comes down to you know your own your you know sort of your own palate and do you like a lot of acidity do you do you want it to be a little more moderated you know that could sort of impact how you feel about these two wines but but also i mean something that's that's interesting from the point of view of a varietal comparison is that literally they were picked within a, a tenth of a brick of each other so that the the Chardonnay, Anno Chardonnay was about 22 and a half bricks. Uh, the Almerino was 22.3. I um, mean, really, they, they have a, a very similar finished alcohol level, too. I think 13.6 and 13.7. So 
those from the point of view of comparison, those parts of the, the winemaking in this case are almost exactly the same. You, you, there are years where those differences would be bigger, but um, very similar ripening time, picked within days, very similar sugar, very similar final alcohol. So yeah. it, it's a real good comparison. Which we couldn't have really planned, but I'm glad it worked out that way because it does kind of come back to the point we started with, which is, you know, why do we make unoaked wines, you know, and it's to really let the fruit shine through. And so I think the fact that there is so much, you know, so, so many constants between these two wines, you know, in terms of where, you know, the sugar levels at which they were picked, you know, how we treated them in the winery, when they were bottled and all of that. Um, I think we've got some pretty big differences in terms of the fruit notes, the acidity, the body here. Um, and like, that's, that's the grape, that's the fruit shining through, you know, it's yeah. not any sort of monkeying that we've done. So um, I think that's kind of neat. Um, so should we yeah. pour so a, I, a I treat we, wine? We've got a... Well, we do, let's, let's look at some questions. Oh, sure, yeah, okay. Um, we, they're slowly piling up as yes. Angela sends thank, them along. Yeah, please, thank you. Um, so Jeff Borman, this is a perfect segue, good question. Does unoaked white wine show off the quality of the fruit and the winemaking skills better? I'm assuming better than something in a barrel or, or red wine. Um, definitely the fruit. Yeah, no, I and I think that's a, a great making. point because for something that, that maybe doesn't get the same sort of attention as as some barrel fermented styles of Chardonnay. There's nothing to hide behind here, right? Yeah. It, it's you need to to have very good fruit, I think, to make this an interesting wine. And that's that's a great contradiction in the way people think of this wine, I think. And and you know it's also one of the reasons why a bunch of unoak styles of Chardonnay are very sort of thin and uninteresting. You 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 know if you're gonna you know, grow a very high crop level Chardonnay and, and sell it fairly inexpensively, you're not typically going to have a lot of personality. And this is, this becomes one of the, the problems with, I think most of the wines we drink is that the vast majority of them aren't that interesting and, and trying to find ones that are is, is, you know, a challenge for everybody. And um, it, it's, you know, a, a lot of the unopened Chardonnays don't have a lot of personality. I think. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it does really show things off really nicely and, you know, oak, especially depending on how much new oak you're using, like those can be very overwhelming aromas, you know, all that vanilla and everything. And so it can, it can mask any sort of, you know, hiccups in terms of either the fruit quality or, you know, sort of missteps maybe along the way, um, which, you know, that happens. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in light white wines. I think that they can be just as serious as, as reds. Um, all right, so David Martin here, you've got a, a really interesting question. So if tannins come from skins and stems, why don't you hear about tannic white wines? Well, I mean, the, the very easiest way to answer that is that we don't ferment these with seeds and skins and stems. We, Tra we Traditionally. Right, right so yeah. we, we, the way these wines are made, and, and really there, there are some exceptions to this, but generally with white grapes, you press the, the clusters, you remove the juice, and you ferment the juice. So you're taking it away from that source of tannin. And, and I, I, don't, I haven't tasted a lot of wines in this style. I've, I've tasted some. I, I think that some of the problem becomes that if you don't have the other sort of anthocyanins and phenolic compounds that are extracted from the skins in, in red grapes, that some of the tannins that you get can sort of become out of balance or out of place in a wine that's, that's this light in structure. I, I feel like you, you don't, it's not quite the same, you don't have enough other substance to back up some of these tannins that come from the seeds uh, in a white wine. But I, you know, in truth, I haven't, I haven't tasted that many of that style of wine. Yeah, I mean, one thing that's becoming kind of hip now is, you know, is orange wine, um, which is theoretic. It's it's white wine made in sort of a red wine, traditional red wine style. So the reason I sort of say traditionally is you could, if you wanted to, you could put the seeds and the the, the skins and the stems uh, in there. And of course, way back when, um, you know, the technology we have today allows us to separate things very nicely and neatly. Um, thousands of years ago, that wasn't possible in the same way. So I think people were often fermenting white what we consider white wine grapes with some of the skins on, and that's where you get sort of the orange wines that you see um, on all these hip uh, sommelier menus nowadays, you know, and they, they, those are white wines with a little bit of skin contact, and you do... You, is, I'm, I'm, I don't know much about orange wines. Is, is, isn't there also sort of an implied kind of oxidized style of winemaking with that, or is that... 
I'm not, not sure. I'm not sure. I feel like I've seen some that are pretty fresh and pretty young, um, okay. but could be, you yeah. mean, yeah, I don't know. But I think that, you know, they definitely, um, you definitely get some of that feeling, you know, from the tannins and, and all of that. And, um, you know, so it's, it's I mean, a personal choice. Do you like it or not? Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, to my, the way I think about it, a, a little bit of lingering bitterness in a, in a wine like this can be very distracting from some of the other qualities we like, which I, I think is probably the reason we typically make it that way. Yeah. Um, so two questions about these, literally the bottles. Um, so why do these two wines have screw caps while the rest of our wines have had corks? And do the bottle shapes uh, and color differences of the glass uh, make a difference? Do we do that on purpose? So let's do let's do the, the screw cap first, and I, I think that <laughs> the the two basic reasons for using a screw cap really are that they're a much better closure than a cork, and they're less expensive. So. I, I do know a lot of people feel strongly about wanting a, a cork in their wines, but some of the basics for this, I mean, we retail, we sell this bottle of wine for 12 to, or 24. $24, which means that most of the wine that we sell to wholesalers around the country, we sell at $12. And at that level, a cork and a foil is almost exactly 10% of the bottle cost. Um, the, the corks we buy now, they cost about a dollar and five cents a piece and the foil is another 20 cents. So you're, you're, that's a, a big chunk of the bottle cost. Um, screw caps are, by varying the liner in the screw cap, you can really vary the oxygen exposure that the bottle sees. And there are a number of different commercially available screw cap liners. I, I think most people tend to use the same one, which is this one, it's, it's Serenex, it's called the liner. Um, and it functions the way I think a very good cork would if you could define that better. But, <clears throat> excuse me, the advantages are that there's, you don't have the same kind of variation that you do from cork to cork, and they don't spoil any of your wine. I mean, they, their screw caps can fail in other ways, but it's, it's less likely. So there's also, and you know, just the cost is one of the practical aspects. The other practical aspect is there's very little resistance, it seems, from consumers to selling this style of wine and screw caps. Um, I wish that was true of all of these wines. I, I think yeah. that, you know, closures are a big topic. Um, the ones we've always used are, are really not necessarily at all the best ones. Um, and I, you know, I think they're smarter. I mean, most people's businesses are focused on improving efficiency and consistency and quality control and, and screw caps do a better job of that than the cork closures we typically use. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we would like to, I mean, every year we do some trials, right? I think we would like to put more wines under screw cap, but um, as Mike said, it's, there's still something about like popping the cork, it's, you know, the sound, it's very romantic. When people pay a lot of money for a bottle of wine, that's kind of what they're expecting. But um, for, you know, lighter styles like this, they seem to be comfortable yeah. with that. Um, but there are also, I mean, many wineries in Napa now have it's sort of an accumulation of cork versus screw cap trials. And in almost every case that I've heard of, the, the screw caps in the long run end up looking pretty good. They, they do. It's not a, it's not a wine quality concern at yeah. all. Yeah. Um, as for the bottle color and shapes, um, we have not always done the Albarino uh, in this style bottle, no. actually. So, um, it is sort of reminiscent of the, you know, sort of Alsatian and like Riesling style bottles that you see, which to me sort of indicates like, you know, those are sort of similar light bodied high acid white wines. Like that's kind of what you're going to get here. Um, Although I think, I think with Albarinos, you see quite a, you, I think, so th this is a traditional burgundy bottle shape. Um, and it, it might be viewed as a little strange to put Chardonnay in something other than this. I, I think there's nothing about these bottle shapes that really sh affects the way the wine ages or, or tastes. Right. Um, but this is sort of the kind of bottle that people put Chardonnay in. And, and that's not a very good explanation, but it's sort of true. Right. I think with, yeah, with, with Albarino bottles, you, you tend to see more variation. You'll see some with the square shoulders. You'll see this style of bottle. Um, so it, it's there's no real strong 
reason to put wines in a particular bottle shape. I mean, wine is light sensitive, but these wines are generally stored in cases in dark places. Um, so that doesn't have an effect long term either. Yeah. Do we have other questions, Ange? Or... Mm -hmm. All right, we've got lots of questions, it looks like. What is the optimal age? This is from Michael Hill. Um, what is the optimal age to drink these wines? Now seems good, but would age help or hinder? Mike, funny, I'm about to ship you funny. some stuff. So, but um, funny you ask. So yeah, so we um, the question is what and and what happens to these wines? And it's very interesting. So the winemaking objective here is is to express that fresh fruit, right? And and that's why we make them and sell them this way. But with time and in bottle, this sort of moves in the direction of of the barrel fermented Chardonnay when we release it. Obviously it doesn't have quite the same oak aromatics, but the personality of the wine gets much more similar to the, to the barrel fermented Chardonnay. And so, and honestly, because this is bottled initially with much less oxygen exposure, some of these wines age very, very well. So I, I think if what you want from these wines is that really kind of fresh fruit, then drink them soon. Um, but you can certainly age them for a, a, quite a while and they continue to be interesting and, and complex, but change in personality. And we, uh, we weren't gonna quite, we weren't gonna do this yet, but I think this is perhaps our last bottle of the first Albarino release um, that we ever did. It's a 2005. Um, and this, what, what, what some of these Albarinos have, you can see a difference in color too. It's, it's certainly darker. Um, but the, so, so Rieslings are sort of famous for, if we hold these up here, you can kind of compare the, the color difference. Rieslings are sort of famous for the, these sort of petroleum aromatics. I mean, sometimes it's really nice and sometimes it smells like a tractor engine, but it, you know, you, you kind of have this petroleum characteristic. And I've seen that in some of our Albarinos as the, I don't think my tasting descriptor was necessarily approved by Angela over there. She made a funny face. Um, but th this, this wine went through a phase of that where I, I thought it had a lot of this petroleum. It has less of it now. We were tasting it. It's 15 years old. And I, I think it's, you know, I am just to prove to you that I don't rave about every old bottle of wine I open. We do tend to, you know, we're, we're picking and choosing about the ones we taste. Um, but this still has plenty of, of complexity. It's moved more and like marmalade was the, the yeah. descriptor that I used. There's a little bit of, you know, it's a little more cooked kind of fruit, but, but still a citrus. Um, and, and there's a little bitterness that I, you know, reminds me of, of marmalade. Yeah. There's more, you, you had a few. Like honey and yeah. to me, very, very ripe, you know, or baked apple, you know? Yeah. Um, if this is like the fresh apple, you know, off the tree, this is, you know, once you put it in a pie kind of, yeah aroma to it so but it's it's acidity it's cool. still gives it a really nice lift so here you go here's you know 15 years and and i i i, I mean i think it tastes great and i'm it's i feel like I'm, I'm losing credibility by saying i like all these <laughs> old wines but i'm i've been picking ones that i do like maybe i can bring one in that i don't here yeah. sometime soon <laughs> some get does. some credibility back um but i mean that still has a ton of acidity my mouth is still watering yeah. from that and um yeah you maybe would pair it differently you know i don't know if i would have it this, I don't know if I would serve with my, my fish tacos. You know, maybe I'd want something with a little more heft to it because it does have these sort of richer flavors now. But yeah. um, which leads us to a great question from Bruce and Ellen LaBelle, some of our club members who um, ask, what is our favorite main course pairing with the Unoak Chardonnay? And I kind of want to turn that around on you guys because you always have fabulous, um, fabulous meals that you're, you know, sending our way and, and some great ideas. So I'd be curious what you guys uh, like to do with this. But um, for me, that would be kind of like a go-to light fish or chicken. Yeah, I mean, I halibut was what popped into my mind. Um, also, I mean, things with a little more richness, like there's, you know, yeah. shrimp. Um, yeah. You know, with things like lobster that often, you know, crab it. It's that's more of a sort of a barrel fermented style for me. But the lighter and even like, you know, we. I've had some fantastic meals like Rhode Island just came to mind and they do all this raw bar stuff. That's absolutely delicious with the, the um, you know, clams and 
mussels and oysters and it, it's it's really good with that stuff too it, and it crosses over with albarino in that category but uh, it's it's really good with that kind of food yeah definitely um do you have any other food um ideas angela that people have sent in a few a few all right mm -hmm. let's see what other people have suggested how about tasting notes or tasting, tasting notes, notes? Yeah. No, we need no, tasting no tasting notes, notes. all right all right um and actually, speaking of food, one thing you guys should do is check out, we have a Pinterest page. Um, as I said, we've been trying to like beef up our social media presence, but we've been doing Pinterest for a long time. Um, Tamara Landry like manages that beautifully. There are lots of really beautiful pictures of the property, but also some really good food ideas. So um, if you're ever curious one night, if you're opening up one of our bottles and you're like, you know, what should I, what should I cook with this? Um, check that out for some fun ideas. Um, so Jeff Borman here is doing pimento pastry bites with bacon. That sounds oh, yeah. really yummy. Um, and I don't know if this is also Jeff or someone else is doing slow roasted head of garlic, oh my gosh, with melted gorgonzola. Wow. These are sounding delicious. Shrimp scampi with lots of lemon from Jane Durkin. Yeah. That sounds good, yeah. As I said before, anything you'd squeeze like a lime or a lemon over with this albarino is I think it kind of accomplishes that same sort of acidity. Oysters wrapped in bacon, Brian Palmer says, that sounds, o oysters is definitely a classic pairing for albarino. Yeah. So people love that. So should we, we have a few minutes left. Should we talk a little bit about what we're going to do next? Yeah. So um, we are, let's see, we, this is something to end with. Oh, okay. We've got a good okay. one. Um, so uh, we just announced, well, first of all, we really want to say thank you to everybody who's on today and who's participated over the last, this is our fifth week, as we said. So um, it's been a lot of fun. If you're local, we actually, there was an article in the Napa Register last week that we were very proud of um, that sort of profiled these tastings and what we're doing. So um, we really, we wouldn't be doing any of this if it wasn't um, for all of you guys. So we're really grateful for that. Um, you know, we know that uh, every state's a little bit different, but it seems like we'll be under uh, quarantine for a little longer here. So we are gonna extend the series through the end of May. So four more weeks. Um, just this week, we announced the tastings and put them up or the, the topics and we put them up on the website. So you can go there and register. Um, unfortunately, as we've mentioned, every every program does require a unique registration. So the links, we've got them all on our website. It's, it's super easy to do. Um, and we are gonna be sending out a little uh, thank you discount code to everybody who's participated in all of these tastings um, if you wanna get any of those um, any of those wines. We'll be revisiting some of these. We'll we still have a couple wines like the Primitivo that we haven't done, so we're going to do that next week. Yeah, we're not going to run out of wine. We're not going to run out of wine. Don't worry. Yeah. Um, so next week we're going to do, um, knowing that there are some new folks here, we're going to talk a little bit about Hendry uh, Ranch, Hendry Winery, and Hendry Family History. I think you can get a little preview with, with some of the, the pictures <laughs> back here, but I, I, I sort of think this might be a little more of a, a slideshow. You know, there'll, there'll be a bunch of old pictures and, and pictures of, of the kind of the progression of the ranch here, um, which could be kind of fun and, and sort of different. So we, we and yeah. that there are a bunch of interesting old stories about my grandfather yeah. and grandmother. So, and Even if you've um, been with us a while, I think some yeah. of them will be. And so this, this yeah, it might be old hat for some of you, but I, I think with some of the, the new people who've joined us, there, there might be some new content as well. And I'll dig deep in the photo piles and see what well, I can yeah. with. We'll find some treasures, even if you are um, an old, older Hendry fan. Um, and then the week after that, we're going to talk a little bit about sort of what a year in the vineyard looks like, sort of do an episode on farming. Um, we've got head farmer right here, so that makes perfect sense. Um, and then it sort of feels like a natural progression to talk about harvest and winemaking. Um, so then once we get the fruit into the um, into the winery, what happens to it. And then we're gonna wrap up with a mailbag episode is what we're calling it. So um, every week you send us lots of uh, questions, which we're grateful for. We try and get to as many as we can, but we know that we don't cover all of them. So um, we'll revisit questions from prior tastings, but if you have any um, that you feel like maybe don't fit neatly or nicely or something into a particular category, just send them our way and um, we'll, we'll tackle them in that in that final episode. So. I'm not at all scared to say I don't know, so I, I might flip through <laughs> a lot like that, but try to stump us anyway. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, see if you can stump my Kendry. So um, with that, uh, thank you again. We'll, we'll... Oh, okay, let's see. <laughs> I th all right, so this is pretty good. Angela's favorite quote from the day, um, and I think this is maybe advice we could all take this week, <laughs> this weekend. 
Kurt Shearer, one of our beloved club members, says that he's going to follow Mike's lead. The next time he goes out to dinner, he's going to order two fish tacos and six bottles of wine. <laughs> Where, it we, worked for me. <laughs> I got some funny looks, but uh, they worked for me. Yeah. I mean, quarantine rules are different rules. So you you, want yeah, how you, many? You, you, yeah. yeah, go for Say, it. See, no, that's what we did. See. Well, um, report back about how that goes. <laughs> and in the meantime, um, you know, check out our website. We'll we'll hopefully see you guys all back here same time, 